Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by uh, Chris, Chris DeRees. Hi, Chris. How are you? Doing well, Mark. How are you? Good. Of course, Chris is one of my co-hosts. Where's our other co-host, Chris? Where's Marissa today? I I think she's preparing preparing for the blizzard. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. L.A. Yeah. L.A. is getting hit by a, a blizzard, right? I, yeah, I but it's not downtown L.A. Uh, I understand. Oh, it's not. What? No, Where is it? It's kind of more mountains or something. It's, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, but she's buckling in for that or getting under a blanket or something. I suspect. I don't know where. Yeah. She's just not here today. She's a softy. <laughs> she's just a softy. Yeah. Um, and also uh, Dante, Dante D'Antonio. Uh, we asked Dante to join a uh, regular here uh, on Inside Economics. Good to see you, Dante. Good to see you too. How are you faring? I'm doing pretty well. I'm leaving for vacation tomorrow, so it's, it's a good day. Ooh, that sounds nice. Are you going anywhere or? Uh, Antigua. Antigua. I've been. Uh, I've been. Antigua's nice. Wow. Yeah. 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 You've been. Have you been? I have not. No. Looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. Uh, when I was your age and I had young kids, uh, we would, uh, when we could afford it, you know, fly down to uh, a Caribbean island and hang out for a while. And Antigua was one of those places. So you know, the nice thing though, my kids, they're not coming, so they're staying. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, I, you know, I I think that's a grave error, frankly. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know your relationship with your wife, so that probably <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. But you know, I my fondest memories, some of my fondest memories with my kids are on those trips. You know, yeah, what, yeah on those trips. But but I'm sure you got many other fond memories. So I I don't mean to I don't mean to get into your your stuff there. Dante. That's okay. That's okay. okay. I do that all the time. And, and we've got uh, Bill Spriggs. Bill, good to see you. You're on mute. Uh, we'll get you on there. Sorry, I thought my space bar was supposed to unmute me. It didn't. <laughs> uh, is, is that work? I never heard of that before. Space yeah, bar. Yeah, so that you don't have to go hunt for your mouse. Oh, that's that sounds convenient. But it didn't work. It didn't seem oh, it didn't work. work. So forget about it. Well, it's good to have you on, Bill. Thanks for having me. Good to yeah. see you. And um, uh, just to formally introduce you, you you are uh, a professor at Howard University, an econ professor. And uh, also the chief economist of the AFL CIO. So is that is that fair to say you're the is that official title, chief economist of That's the AFL CIO? And how long have you been the chief economist for AFL CIO? Eleven years now. Oh, I did not know that. Wow. Okay. So you do? How do you do double duty like that? How do you? Well, you know, what's the deal? The, you, uh, the AFL CIO gives a grant to Howard. It buys out part of my time. Oh, I see. Very interesting. And of so course, you check, were. My check says Howard University. Oh, the check comes from Howard. I see, right. but I see. Got it. Got it. And um, of course, you were in the Obama administration as well in the Labor Department. Correct. Yeah. And as uh, assistant secretary for policy. I bet that was a cool experience. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. It was sort of life comes full circle. Uh, in the Clinton administration, I hit it. What was the National Commission for Employment Policy. And when Republicans came in uh, the early 90s, they got rid of that. They didn't think it was necessary for us to evaluate our job training program. <laughs> no. For fortunately, I had left there to join the Joint Economic Committee when that happened. But, um, but then I landed the Department of Labor and the Obama administration wanted to make sure that there was evaluation of all federal programs. And part of the legislation that they put in place then recreated an evaluation arm for the Department of Labor. So as assistant secretary, I got to recreate my old job. Oh, that's cool. So you had you you had implemented these uh, these this oversight. It got torn down and then you had to re resurrect it again is it is it still in place now in the uh, in the biden yes, administration there, there is still a, a chief evaluation officer and i see office of policy now. yeah very cool and you you've been kind of a fixture in kind of dc for a long time i i was looking at your bio you mentioned mentioned the joint economic committee you're also at the economic policy institute a very well-known it's fair to say it's a think tank, right? That's Larry Michelle. I I know Larry. That's yes. who I go to Larry immediately. Larry was my office mate in graduate school. Oh, good luck with that. I bet that was a real trip. Yeah. Oh, it was 
uh, we were we were a rock in office. <laughs> I bet you guys are like uh, firing each other up. I bet. Yeah. We did. So, yeah. 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 He's and, a good guy. Um, he was research director when I worked at ETI. Uh, I came back later when he was president as sort of a senior person for a brief stint before I, I went to Harvard. Got it. And um, I, I follow him on Twitter. Are you on Twitter, Bill? Are you on Twitter? Uh, I. It used to be very active on Twitter. It gives me funny feelings. So, uh, yeah. so now I don't tweet as often. I, I will do it on Jobs Day. Yeah. And I used oh, to yeah, do I have seen that day like yeah. you know for half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm I, I haven't done as much. Yeah, I I I'm on at Mark Zandy. I advertise that any, any chance I get, but uh, I am I got a little annoyed this past week because. Turns out someone had gotten at Mark Sandy with two eyes and was impersonating me and, you know, copying my tweets and tweeting them out and also talking to people I know and saying stuff. And they come back to me and said, Mark, what are you saying? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I go, what are you talking about? And so here's a real thing that irritated me. I, I, uh, said to the Twitter, look, someone's impersonating me. And they, they sent back a, an email saying, well, they don't really violate our rules. I go, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? It finally relented, and so th this this impersonator has been blocked. But you know, highly irritating. Uh, anyway, well, uh, the, you know, the, I think that's the secret of where did all those Twitter employees go? Why this Twitter? Ah, uh, and and so it's things like that yep. that um, people who use Twitter a lot would notice. But a lot of people wouldn't necessarily notice. Yeah, there was yeah. there was a piece of the post yesterday saying, "Oh, so they really were redundant because Twitter's still going well." Oh, but, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, and so yeah. I I I think that's um, a lot of technology is lowering the quality. Of I I agree with you. It's a, it's more of a corrosive. It's not like a cliff event. It's like a corrosive on the quality of what's being provided, and you don't notice it immediately. But over time, stuff like that uh, what I just described happens, and I, I totally agree. I think that's what's going to happen here. But um, well, let's dive into the meat of the matter, and uh, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, and uh, today, this is uh, what Friday, February twenty fourth. We got some. Well, we got a lot of economic data uh, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and it's causing a little bit of agita. Well, I'd say a, a fair amount of agita in markets, financial market, stock, bond markets, uh, foreign exchange. So let's let's just talk about that a little bit. Uh, I'm sure uh, I'm I'm feeling Chris kind of looking uh, looking at him. He might be gloating at the moment. I'm not sure. No. Okay. All right. Uh, Dante, just one you data want to, point. Just it's one data. Oh, you're right. It's one data. That was going to be what I said. But okay. Thank you, uh, Dante. <laughs> you want to give us a, a bit of a rundown on on the data? Sure. I mean, we got uh, big big readings in terms of month over month changes in personal income and and real uh, personal spending. Um, you know, those numbers were driven in large part by, you know, sort of end of year changes. You got cost of living adjustments uh, for Social Security that went into effect in January. You had a, a host of minimum wage increases across the country. Uh, so certainly some, you know, sort of one-off beginning of the year events that were causing some of that uh, spike in, in income and spending. Uh, and then we also got the, the PCE deflator for January, which was 0.6%, uh, both That's top it. line Just and to stop core. stop for a second. The yeah. uh, consumer expenditure deflator. So it's the kind of favored, the core, which is excluding food and energy, is kind of the favored measure that the Fed looks at for gauging inflation. And their target, so-called target, is 2% for core CPI inflation, which means monthly 0.1.2. That's what kind of the gains you'd like to see. Yeah, and, and so certainly the January reading was up a little bit from prior months, although the year over year numbers are still coming down, you know, maybe a bit more slowly than people would like to see. But you know, I think mm -hmm. it, it sent a similar message from what we got from CPI earlier in the month that, you know, the moderation in inflation is going to be probably a little bit of a bumpy road. Yeah. Hey, Chris, did you look at those data at all? Uh, was that something on your radar screen this morning? Yeah, a, a little bit. I haven't gone deep uh deeply into it but um what's your take yeah uh well i think you're you're right the market interprets it certainly as a, as a hot number i think they may be reading it very closely and then 
uh, assuming that the uh, the Fed is going to be uh, very aggressive. Maybe 50 basis point rate hike is back on the table now. Oh, is it? Yeah, uh, or, to some degree. I don't think it's mm -hmm. certainly not a done deal, but uh, mm -hmm. that is certainly in in the zeitgeist here after after mm -hmm. the number came out. Mm -hmm. So, hey, yeah. so so your 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 view is well, it's hot. Meaning it's hot. The, the inflation the spending number the spending was number hot, was hot, hot too that uh, yep. Dante mentioned. So it seems if, if putting it all together, if you believe the uh, the labor market report as well, that that was hot, right? So we. Everything seems a, a little bit uh, frothy at the moment. Yeah. Okay. At least at face you, value, right? If you take it at face value, but you, as you said, uh, never put too much weight on any one given month's worth of data. That's right. One 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 data point, and we've been talking a lot about the seasonal adjustment issues, mm -hmm. measurement issues. Dante referenced some of the the changes in the data as well. So, mm -hmm. you, know, you need to take it uh, with a grain of salt. Yeah. Hey, Bill, do you watch these data? Like you can see, we're pretty nerdy here. You know, we're like in the bowels of the these data. Uh, do you do you follow the statistics like that? Or I mean, like today's numbers? Or were you uh, following them or have a view on them on personal income and spending and inflation? Yes, I do, and um, I am irritated at my profession. I think that economists Ooh. should have well expected that if you blow up markets the way that we did, that you're going to have long-running ripple effects and to think that the markets will calm down uh, after an unprecedented series of shocks in two years is unrealistic. I don't think we have been helping the American people understand the situation at all. And, um, you know, the fact that we get the labor market back, that was really a miracle of uh, uh, policy that we we decided that we would be aggressive in making sure people came back to work. But, but for prices to settle when we've disrupted the markets in terms of supply, in terms of, uh, you know, fulfilling demand as we did during the pandemic when we couldn't go certain places, couldn't buy certain things. You, you, you cannot disrupt the markets and then send out these ripple effects and then think that you reach equilibrium boom like that because it's just not, that's not possible. Yeah. So just to paraphrase what you said, I hope just to make sure I got it right, you're saying, hey, look, we, we got hit hard by some massive shocks. I mean, the obvious, the pandemic and the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. This created massive dislocations in the global economy, labor markets, product markets, supply chains, you, you name it, everything got kind of turned on its head. Um, and of course, dramatic policy response from central banks, the Fed, from uh, fiscal policymakers, the administration and Congress. And to think that this economy is going to kind of settle down, get back to, let's call it normal, <laughs> you know, quickly, like, like right now is like, uh, that just doesn't make any sense. That, that's what you're saying. Right. And so I think people need to pay attention to direction. Are prices coming back down? That's the key element. And for me, this is where I get more upset at the Fed because um, at least, you know, in, in labor, our big concern has been the lack of chips. Because in the auto industry, finished product was at the level of the Great Recession. But the, you know the the data was very misleading on autos because that was the finished product. They had hundreds of thousands of cars sitting in warehouses and parking lots throughout Detroit waiting for the chips. You cannot take auto production to Great Recession levels. And then think, oh, nothing else will happen. Right. right. And so when everybody was shocked, astonished, whatever, you know, that used car prices would go up, it, uh, you know, that like, yeah, this, this is econ one. That's a, that's a question on econ one. I oh, lower I, auto production to the lowest level in the 21st century, lower than even numbers from the 20th century. 
so what's so gonna happen? and what's going to happen and so of course if somebody comes to the park you know to, to to the auto lot and they see that they can't get a car they're told we can get you a car in eight months then of course i'm going to say well what do you have on the lot so of hmm. course the used car prices can go through the roof i mean this is to be expected so what bothers me is like you look at the CPI and the price of used cars year over year um, are down 11.6%. Mm -hmm. So the concern from the Fed had been, oh, well, no, you you shouldn't look at it as this is a one-time shock. Expectations will build in. People are going to you know, demand that these prices stay this level and blah, 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 right? But the prices are falling 11% over the year. So, so it's not like they're rising at a slower rate. The things that were actually impacted by some of these shocks that we said were temporary, the prices are falling. The price of smartphones year over year down 23.9%. That's not in the news. I don't understand why that's not in the news. You can't tell me we have a problem with huge demand oversupply and the price of smartphones is down 23.9%. But this is what we said. I mean, unlike autos, you, you can complete an automobile up to a point, and then you got to put in the chip. You, you, a telephone is nothing but smart chips. You can, you're, right. you're up the creek. You can't do anything. So suddenly, production is back. The price is falling by a lot. So so this, this was all temporary. The other things we have, I mean, we still have the shocks from it. Uh, we we still have huge disruptions to food production, and and food goes into a lot of things. So uh, it's it's it 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 just isn't possible to have the other things fall as dramatically as smartphones. Major appliances, you've got to have chips for major appliances. Um, you know, that's down three point nine percent. Well, let me let me down. let me all, unpack. All of these prices are falling, not rising at a slow rate. They're falling, totally consistent with that shock is over. So these other shocks, which we are still suffering from, I think we should similarly feel that because the overall price trend is coming down, that in fact we don't have this, you know, inflation is out of control situation. We have these disruptions are slowly mm -hmm. easing. Um, but we're going to have to continue to deal with them because this, like this weird weather, I mean, you know, who knew it would snow in LA in March? Yeah, and 80 degrees in DC, as you were pointing out before the, the call. Hey, you said a lot. Let me unpack a little bit of that. First off, uh, Econ 1, is that, yes. I thought it was Econ 1, in my, my day it was Econ 101. What, has that changed to Econ 1? Well, uh, at Howard, it's Econ 001. It zero, oh, zero, on, zero, 001. It, okay. It, 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 it depends upon the, the, the college. Yes. Uh, at, at my undergrad, it was Econ 101. 101. Chris, were, was your 101 or were you one? 101. Yeah. 101. And Dante, well, Dante was probably, well, Dante skipped 101. He didn't even need to do 101. No, more confusing. I, right? I think at Penn State, it was Econ 2 and 4, which was micro and macro, which made no sense to me. Like, oh, like, no like sense. 1 and 3, <laughs> I, so I don't know. Right, right. Okay, well, now that we got that settled. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me, <laughs> let me push back. First of all, Bill, let me say I'm very mm -hmm. sympathetic to your perspective, but I'm going to push back, and then I'm going to let the other, other two guys weigh in as well. But uh, the, I think the concern is not, at this point, when we were talking about inflation and monetary policy and, you know, what the Fed should be doing or not doing, which is obviously critical to the economic outlook, whether we go into a recession or not, because that depends on how aggressive the Fed needs to be here to quell the inflation. It's not so much goods prices anymore. I mean, I think most people would say, yeah, you're right, Bill. Good prices are falling. That was disrupted by uh, uh, the, the uh, supply shocks created by the pandemic and perhaps the Russian invasion chips is the poster child right of the covid disruptions and the vehicle industry is you know the prime example of you know the disruptions so no argument there but i think the concern at this point is that the increase in inflation due to these supply shocks has 
uh, affected inflation expectations, you know, particularly among workers and consumers. So if you go look at the University of Michigan survey of consumer expectations, they're coming down, but they're still pretty elevated. Or look at the New York Federal Reserve survey of c consumer expectations. They're coming down, but they're still pretty elevated. And that's gotten into wages. And then once it gets into wages, it feels like inflation potentially gets into the service side of the economy, becomes uh, metastasizes in a sense. And that's much more difficult to kind of ring out. And right now, uh, that's the concern. So if you look at today's inflation numbers, the consumer expenditure for the core, CP, uh, core PCE, and you look at the so-called super core, this is now Jay Powell, the Fed of the chair, has pointed this as the, the statistic he's most focused on. That's services X housing, that that actually remains stubbornly high and actually jumped again in, in the month of January. And yeah, you know, it could be warm weather, which juiced up demand. And of course we've got all this income flowing into the economy because of a big hike in social security payments that juiced up demand, which could result in higher prices. And yeah, we've got seasonal adjustment issues, both in terms of the warm weather and just so-called residual seasonality because the pandemic messed with all the, stati the statistical techniques to tease out the seasonality. So, but nonetheless, that's where the problem lies. What do you think? Is that you're saying we shouldn't be worried about that, nervous about it, hair on fire? That's just the wrong kind of perspective to have on that? It gets a yawn for me. Oh, it's a yawn. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I, I, I find it poorly informed. Okay, so um, Dan, explain. Dan, 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 Dante went over this, and it's very key to understand, right? We are in a process of raising our minimum wage in the states where the majority of Americans live. And that started pre-pandemic when we were, we, you know, in the final stages of recovery, but wages at the bottom had not responded. It's very hard to understand how we had several years of lower unemployment, you know, from 2019 and 2020, and wages weren't responding, and most states then stepped in and raised their minimum wage because we hadn't raised it in over a decade. It was at its lowest real level almost ever. And so, and it is in the states that haven't raised it. So now, if you go from 725 to 15, you have to bake in huge increases, right? Because you go 725, the next step in some states was nine. Mm. Well, that's a huge percentage increase. And so even the states that didn't go to 15, like Missouri, that only went to 12, they went from 725 to 10. These are huge increases. All of the wage increase, when you look at the data, is coming in those industries that are dominated by low wage workers. So the biggest industry where that's true is um, food services. So if you looked at their increases, yeah, they were getting 10, 12% increases because the minimum wage was going up 10, 12%. And, and as a result, those wages made the distribution look pretty potent because our wage distribution is so skewed towards low wage workers and it did need a correction, but it wasn't the rest of the labor market. I mean, if you looked at other workers, it was 3%, 4%, <clears throat> me, very modest wage increases that were taking place. And when you look at what unions were able to negotiate, it's not like employers were out there going, oh yes, we wanna give you know big, raises we see the incident now with the train wreck involving norfolk southern we have to remember how the rail industry responded <laughs> they didn't respond in this moment with big wage increases with what ended up being negotiated through uh congress and the mm -hmm. white house to, to to reach that resolution it had nothing to do with inflation it did the, the, the their wage was way below the inflation rate in fact uh, and and the companies refused, even with that little tiny wage increase that they gave, they still refused to give workers time off. So so you know you cannot point to a single labor contract that's been negotiated where 
workers have been saying, oh, wow, you know, we got to get a 10% increase or 8% increase or a 7% increase. That's not where it's going, where, where workers actually get to bargain and the companies are not responding with the sense that we have to give them. We, you know, this is a really terrible labor type. And we gotta, that's not how they've been responding. So, so, so what, what has been happening is as we slowly get to the 15 or $12 or whatever the state set, those wage increases at the bottom are moderated pretty good. And, and so we're, we're, we're seeing the bottom slowly pull down what are the wage increases that we see reported and wages are, are coming back in. There is no market. There is no labor market in America where this gets baked in. It's impossible to bake in inflation. It's impossible. It's, uh -oh. not, it's not on the map. It's impossible. Okay, so you're saying the uh, way the strong wage growth we, we've we've observed over the last uh, couple three years or so is largely by uh, the result of uh, state minimum wage increases across the country, and they're they're being phased in over time, obviously. And so that's stepping up wages, particularly for and obviously this would affect low wage workers. That beyond that you don't see significant wage pressures, at least not pressures that would result in feigning higher rates of inflation. That, that, that's kind that's of correct. Okay. That's correct. Because what, what you have to remember is we have starved wages at the bottom and only when you have a good tight labor market and the minimum wage do you get anything happening at the bottom. We've mandated wage increases, but when the labor market is tight, you get one more boost, which is because firms are hiring at the same time we're raising the minimum wage, and if I'm a worker, any job I get is gonna be a wage increase, right? Because, because I, have, I have to get the minimum wage increase, but those employers that are slightly above the minimum wage, yep. those employers who are doing more to protect their wage structure, right? Because there's the issue of wage compression. So is if, if I'm currently making 20 cents more than the minimum, is my company only going to say, okay, well, you just get the minimum wage. We're just sure. going to have wage compression. You will, you will now make as much as anybody I hire off the street. Or will my company say, I got to pay you 20 cents more than the minimum? And because any other employer is doing the same thing, it's easy for me to switch and get a higher wage job. And, and you saw this in a recent report from the Fed, the large number of workers who are switching jobs and getting significant wage increases. And that's because no matter what, I'm gonna, you know, if the minimum is going to 10, I'm gonna get $10 an hour. But because I was already above the minimum, there are gonna be employers out there who are gonna respect that wage gap and I'm and going to get preserve a, it, it yeah. get, get an even bigger wage increase. Yeah, so, so that 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 is that is what has been going on. And so that that's to your optimism this is temporary because the we're coming to the end of these uh, minimum wage hikes and and as that comes to an end uh, we'll see wage growth uh, norm, let's, let's say normalize get back to something that's more consistent with the Fed's target. That's, That's right, because, because many people overestimate the power of a low unemployment rate on wages. They, this is why the oh, overestimate, you said, Bill, overestimate, overestimate. overestimate. They, be, because the, the current interpretation is these wage increases are from a low unemployment rate. They're not from a low unemployment rate. They're, they're from we, we raised the minimum wage and we had a low unemployment rate. Uh, oh, okay, so, so let me, and, and I'm, Sorry, guys, I'm going to turn it back to you in one second, but I just want to ask one other follow-on question that seems to be a natural result of what you're saying, or maybe you've already said it and I missed it. The 3.4% unemployment rate, which is at a, I don't know, got to go back to 1969 to find that unemployment rate, uh, is, is not consistent with a, an economy that's operating beyond full employment. That's pretty consistent with well, you characterize it. Is it full employment? Are we not at full employment? Or would you 
disregard any that concept altogether. No, we have a whole lot of space left. Whole lot of space it, left. Okay. Yeah, because labor force participation is endogenous to the labor market. Yeah. And and so we cheat if we only look at the unemployment rate and don't consider where we are in labor force participation. Black and brown workers are used to lower wages. They disproportionately work in lower wage industries. And the labor force response so far has been among those marginalized workers. So the labor force participation of Blacks and Hispanic workers has been growing much faster than for whites. It continues to grow. There's a lot of room left uh, to grow. If we finally get broader wage growth, then we're going to see um, white labor force participation start to, to, to respond as well. So far, uh, white labor force participation is still been unimpressed by these these wages, which, again, for me, is another indication that the wage growth really isn't all that, that it's not pulling in, it's not pulling in white work. Hmm. Hey, uh, Chris, let me turn to you. Uh, how, how, what do you think uh, of this argument? I mean, uh, usually I'm kind of sort of over where Bill is, but Bill's even further over than I am. <laughs> so, so what do you think of, of what Bill is saying? I guess I'm trying to connect the dots to the overall inflation picture here, right? So we're, right? So Dante started off saying, oh, the PCE is up, right? And then now we're going through trying to understand what the components are. So clearly the overall wage uh, component has is still high, right? The wages are rising 5%. And I see that as a driver, certainly, of in the overall inflation picture. Are you suggesting that's not the case or that it's not important? Or I guess I'm trying to, to square the circle here in terms of- Well, well I think, think you're saying it's temporary. Problem, it's temporary. It's the, temporary. The, the wage growth is not the result of an overly tight labor market. That's not it. You got that wrong. What it's about is uh, just the minimum wage. Yeah, I've, and, it, and it's when I say temporary, it's over a period of several years because most states phase these increases in over a period of time. But we're getting close to the end of that. Wage growth is actually moderating now. I mean, it's it's went from five to closer to four most recently, and that would be consistent with that 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 uh, observation. And therefore, you know, yeah, maybe it helped to support inflation, but you know, that's temporary. It's going to come back in. Did I get that right, Bill? Sorry, I didn't mean to. That, that is exactly my point. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We, we we totally underestimate how many people make less than $15 an hour. I mean, when we were arguing for this, and this was one of President Biden's initial things. And so back in 21, you know, we wanted this 15. It was astounding the share of American workers under $15 an hour. It's a huge number of people. And because their wages are so low and we're raising them so much, it's going to show up in the average, even if people at the top and in the middle aren't getting very many gains. So it, it, if it was the case that it was really being driven by labor shortages, right, you would think it should really show like in manufacturing, where uh, manufacturing employment was totally recovered from the dip that took place during the pandemic. And it's rising and it's back on track to continue its recovery from the Great Recession. And in construction, we're at record levels in terms of construction. These are skilled workers. So you would think if you're talking about a tight labor market, it ought to really show up with these skilled workers where we're suddenly seeing this demand go up and their, their wages are not going up six and seven percent they're not going up five percent dante what do you think dante actually does he's a good great he came from bls he's a great labor market economist and uh, uh unlike me uh, you know he actually runs a lot of uh, regressions i've kind of gotten out of that habit. <laughs> i kind of just say stuff uh, you know and then i go dante did i get this right let's go prove it uh, and uh, Dante is in the business of proving it. So, so what do you think? And I know you've done a lot of work around the minimum wage too. I think so. Let me throw it back to you. And participation. Let me throw it back to you. 
Yeah, I would say, I, you know, I, I buy the argument. I think the big question in my mind is, you know, if we believe that the labor market today isn't really fundamentally tighter than it was in 2019, which by most measures, it's not. It's about at the same place that we were pre-pandemic. Your wage growth pre-pandemic, we struggled to get to 3%, right? Mm -hmm. So if the labor market's just as tight today as it was then, how do we have wage growth that's significantly higher? And, you know, the minimum wage story is a piece that would add to that, you know, sort of help help figure that puzzle out, right? That's the the new thing that's happened. So we've got a labor market that's roughly as tight as it was in 2019, but we've got, you know, all of these, you know, 25, 30 states that are still in the process of, of hiking minimum wages. Um, and so I certainly think that contributes to sort of the elevated rate of wage growth that we're seeing today relative to, you know, the 3% we were seeing at the end of last cycle. Um, you know, whether it accounts for the entire gap between, you know, sort of 3% and where we are right now, I think that may be up for debate, but I, I certainly think that as you see those wage increases start to slow, right, as the pace of those increases and the number of states increasing minimum wages, I think you would see, you know, sort of assuming everything else stayed the same, you'd see wage growth start to come in as a result of that, right? So I certainly think it is a component of that that gap in wage growth that we're seeing today versus a few years ago. Let me say two things. One, uh, I my working hypothesis, Bill, wasn't around the minimum wage as to why wage growth jumped and why it's starting to come back in. It goes to inflation. My point about inflation expectations, they, they jumped when Russia invaded and oil prices, gas prices, which is so key to people's thinking about future inflation jumped. And now that oil and gas prices are back in, inflation expectations are coming back. And you, again, you can see it in the surveys and wage growth is monitoring. I didn't consider what you're pointing out here around the minimum wage. And the second thing I'd say is, Dante, we, we should be able to figure this out, right? I mean, we've got controlled experiments. We've got different states raising minimum wages at different times in different amounts. So that's a perfect uh, set of data for uh, you know regression analysis to kind of tease this out. So Bill, you just made me assign a, 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 a project for Dante. I gave him some work to do. <laughs> Sorry, Dante. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we, we had looked at it a little while back, but I think it's worth dusting. Oh, I, yeah, I thought we had. I thought we had. We should resurrect that. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, Dante, one of the best dissertations I supervised, which was last year. Uh, one of my students did the whole job search model with the minimum wage. Before, uh, it has been so long since we raised the minimum wage that the, the ability we have to look at job to job switches versus unemployment flows into employment, that data was over a horizon where the minimum wage hadn't done anything. So uh, her, her, she, she, she benefited from the fact that because she finished the dissertation last year, she had a couple of years where there are minimum wage increases going on across the states. And, and it is so telling that the wage pressure doesn't, wage pressure does not come from unemployment to employment. We already kind of knew that before we knew it came from job to job. But when you throw in the minimum wage, even, even the job to job becomes less important. It, it, it is so important, particularly at the bottom 60% of the wage distribution. It's not very important. It's, hmm. it's not significant above that. And it's not, it, you know, when you get to that middle uh, quintile, it's not so big. It's really huge for the bottom 40%. And that's where the wage growth has been the biggest. Then wage growth at the top, again, for these skilled workers who, I mean, because we're at construction levels that are historic. So this isn't like, oh, all the construction workers have come back home from pre-pandemic. These, these are new construction workers. So, so construction firms are desperate for people with skills. So you, you would think if it happens, it has to be these manufacturing and these construction workers who would drive wages, not these workers at the bottom, but it's the workers at the bottom. Well, I have I have one one question, and then we're going to go play the game, the statistics mm -hmm. game, and then we're going to come back and and uh, talk about uh, a couple of other issues that I, I'd like to, to tackle with you, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to wage growth, 
you, you've mentioned this a few times that it, it's mostly at the bottom part of the distribution of wages. And you certainly can see that at least uh, it, it, it's, it seems intuitive if you look at wage growth by industry. So mm -hmm. we've got you know, leisure hospitality, low paying, you can see the wage growth, retailing, low, low, low wage, you can see the growth. But are you looking at something else? Are you looking at other data when you say, you know, skilled workers are not getting big pay increases? I mean, I, I, I would, I tend to go right to the Atlanta Fed's wage tracker, you know, uh, as a measure. Are you, is that what you focus on or is there something else you're focusing on when you say that? No, I look at industry and then I, and I look at this distribution analysis that has been done. Upjohn does a, 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 okay. a great job at this as well. And, and the growth has really created a wage compression, mostly because for the first time, people at the bottom are really gaining uh, relative to everyone else. And, and at very large, and again, at very large amounts, this is not um, typical. And we did see it pre-pandemic because pre-pandemic, some of the states had started to raise their minimum wages. Mm -hmm. So so even pre-pandemic, we were seeing the wage growth at the bottom faster than in the middle and the top. And again, as, as Dante pointed out, at similar levels of unemployment, but higher levels of employment to population ratio. So, so the labor market was a little tighter then than now. And- um, You didn't have the wage growth. And, and yeah. then, you know, what people still have to explain is why is the labor force participation for black and latino workers rising at such a fast rate relative to whites and and again that's it, it, it's just the those wage those yeah. wages are up much more for them so so you're getting a bigger labor force participation response than you are among whites who make significantly more. Yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't noticed that about the, you know, the racial differences between uh, participation. I need to go look at that. Well, let, let's play the game, the statistics game. And just to remind the listener, um, uh, the, the game is we each put forward a, a number uh, statistic. Uh, the rest of the group tries to figure that out through questions, uh, clues, deductive reasoning, the best statistic is one that's not so easy that we all get it immediately uh, and uh, not so hard that we never get it. And if it's apropos to the topic at hand, uh, bonus. Uh, so, Dante, I'm going to begin with you. Um, I think I warned you I was going to come to you first, didn't I? I you believe did. I did. Yeah, okay. Uh, so so this better be a good statistic, Dante. Yeah, <laughs> fire away. Uh, I'm going to go with 0.16%. 0.16. Yeah. Is it in today's uh, uh, data dump from the Bureau of Economic Analysis on spending income and inflation? It, it is. is. Okay. It's a month to month yeah. change. It's percent a, change. Yes. Yes. Uh, is, is it uh, related to income? No. Is it related to spending? Yes. <laughs> You see how you do this, Bill? I'm going to wear him down, baby. It's, it's... Uh, is it a category of spending? It is not a category of spending, no. Oh, okay. Now I'm stumped. I'm, I'm glad not... you clearly you were not a careful reader of your your email right before the podcast. So I was, I was hoping it didn't give this one away. Oh, because I was firing all kinds of questions at these guys. Uh, uh, Six. In, in the spending number, uh, it's not a category of spending. Uh, um, gee whiz! If it's if it's in the spending data and it's not a category of spending, then what the heck is it? <laughs> it's a is it, it a derived with, measure or something? It has to do with the top line spending number, right? It was one point one percent, right? That was the top line month over month change. Yeah, right. Point one six is related to that number. Oh, uh, is it? Is uh okay? But it's not like um. I think both goods and services spending were up. Oh, is it real? Is it the real spending up point? No. Yeah, it could be real spending was up point one. No, no, because the real spending was up 1.1. 1. 1. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm foundering here. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, it, that's a tough one. Yeah. It was reported. It was as reported. It's not a derived number. 
it, it's an average so it's not it's directly average. reported i don't think oh you did you averaged it I and i should know this because i i wrote about this in my email to you no somebody emailed it to you this morning oh bernard <laughs> bernard yaros our other colleague um I don't know. I don't like some so type is, of is it an average over more than one month? It is an average over more than one month. Yeah. Oh, but it's the past three months. Correct. Because right. because it's real small. Bill goes. Bill deserves credit for that. Yes. Yeah. Bill yes. deserves credit for that. Yeah. So because so real average. spend go explain. Explain. Yeah. So real spending was up 1.1% January, which was you know artificially inflated by the changes that happened with social security, with minimum wages. But spending had been down in November and December. So the average mm. increase in spending over the last three months is only 0.16%. That's actually less than half the rate of growth compared to the three months prior, right? So spending is not as strong as this number today signals. It's, it certainly seems to be weakening from the end of 2022. I think it just it sort of adds to that same storyline that the economy is likely headed for you know slower times ahead. You know, spending is, is not nearly as strong as that 1.1% suggests. Here's the thing that really strikes me about the real consumer spending. This is uh, after inflation consumer spending. It's incredibly, the growth in that real consumer spending is incredibly stable. I mean, if you look year over year, because that you know cuts through the ups and downs and all arounds in the monthly data, we're a little over 2% real. Last month, we were a little bit below 2%. And if you, you know, take a step back, it's been hovering around 2%, which by the way, is exactly the spending growth you want to see. It's not too hot, not too cold. That it's kind of like right down the fairway kind of spending for more than a year. It's just it, it, what what seems to be happening is consumers, households, are calibrating their spending. You know, drawing down their excess saving, calibrating their spend, uh, their uh, the 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 drawdown to to get the the you know typical spending. No, nothing out of bounds. You know, people aren't spending with abandon. They're just doing. What they typically do is that is Dante. Is that a fair characterization? I, I mean, it certainly seems what's happening in the data. I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. so it seems like people are trying to keep their spending levels relatively stable. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good way to look at it. We don't. What bothered me when we we had that disruption, and, and all of us knew, well, you know, doing year over year is going to be a big problem because it was, you know, consumption had been down so much. Is 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 again figure out what do you consider to be demand what's you know people were screaming about the demand for autos is what was driving up prices not the fact that we couldn't make autos faster than we could in the totally. great yep. recession and it's like but what you know the auto, autos you, you have to think of as a flow like is is it is it a year or is it per two years or what what do you really want to have as, as a measure this longer term view that the growth is pretty consistent, mm -hmm. I think, is what we're supposed to be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, it, it, it's the way of smoothing over an unprecedented period that has no, you know, that has, I think, challenged us on these notions about what what's the proper measure for demand. When you yeah. don't have these kind of disruptions, then you can get used to it. That's two percent. It's always two percent, right? But but what happens when when you it drops four percent, or then what do you do? Right, right. Oh, very good. Well, that was a good one, Dante. I I, I mean, I, I'm a little shamed. We should have gotten that more quickly. That was a really good one. Uh, and you're right, Bernard Yaros, our other colleague, in, in an email my exchange made actually said point one six. Right. You're right. You're right. Chris, let me go to you next. Uh, what's your statistic? Okay, uh, down. So negative 25.9% and up 7.2%. So two Down. statistics somewhat related. Right? Somewhat Stop. related. Oh, well, geez. they're not from this, they're not from the same release, but they are related conceptually. Right. Okay. Well, uh, standard set of questions. Are they from today's BEA data dump? No. They're not. Okay. No. It, uh, so I'm not keeping with the uh oh, the... they're not labor market related either. Is it housing? They're housing it's housing housing related it, you, bill you got to know chris he he's, he's a houser uh, you know he okay. just loves the housing data uh and, and with good reason he's a really good housing economist uh is it related to house prices no oh is it okay. related to housing starts nope home sales 
One of them is home new home sales. New home sales of just today. Yep. So it's the seven point two percent is the increase in new home sales released today. Oh, I missed that. I didn't year I, over year. You could see that. So, okay. So. What's the level? Do you know offhand, Chris? Six seventy. Okay. Six hundred. That's not bad, actually. Six hundred seven. No, it's yeah stronger than we anticipated, and we were on the high end of consensus. Existing home sales are down twenty five point nine percent. No, no. They're down a lot though, because year over year they're down a lot. They are. Yeah, it might be close, but that's yeah, not the number it's not the number you had in mind. No. Uh, uh, the 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 rent offers is dropped dramatically since summer. Is it? It's not that rent. would be that would be a big decline. Twenty five percent. Prices. Yeah. Came out yesterday. Uh, yes. It came out yesterday. Oh. Part of a a bigger report. Oh. Share of income spent on housing? No. Nope. No. That that would came from the BEA. Came from the BEA. What came out yesterday? GDP came out yesterday. GDP. Oh, residential investment was down twenty five point nine percent in the single fourth. family, I would assume. Or is it well, total res resident? residential investment? Yeah. All in residential is down 25%. Oh, okay. On a, on a annualized basis in the fourth quarter. Oh, in the fourth. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So okay, the idea great. was that that's the, the backward looking number, right? Yep. Q4 was weak, but forward looking, perhaps. Uh, you oh, know, you see how he it. does this now? He's trying to make sense out of these forward. numbers. Crazy numbers he picks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the month, no, month increase I I, I, in I new like home sales two, versus though. the quarterly I... annualized decline in resident <laughs> realization. Okay, we're going to connect those dots. Okay, the way I connected is backward looking, forward looking. Okay. There you go. There All you right. go. All right. Well, what what's the, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of messages there, but what's the one, what do you want to point out with the, the statistics? Oh, uh, that just that uh, uh, consistent with uh, some of the other hot statistics, housing also seems to be perhaps yeah. turning the corner, at least based on this do you new home that, sales though? number. Do you believe that? I, mean, I think uh, I think bottoming. I, I, I don't bottoming. see I don't see another leg down unless something else major happens. But in sales, you don't expect in another. sales, correct? Yeah, yeah, right. Do you think uh, that the drag from housing, and this is really single family housing, uh, that minus 25% annualized decline is probably bulk of that, vast majority of that's probably single family. Yeah. Do you think we're finished with that drag or are we pretty close? Are we going to see more declines in construction, uh, single family construction here or are we pretty close to the end of the drag? I expect that we're close closer to the end. I mean, completions will continue throughout the year, right? So permits and starts we know are down and they're going to take a while to pick back up. Although you're seeing some signs of life there too, but the completions, the construction, uh, home building continues because there's such a pipeline on both the single family and multifamily side. So I expect that to continue to contribute. And you're yeah. not worried about the mortgage rate chasing away that? Uh, uh, certainly possibly, um, but uh, at least our forecast calls for mortgage rate to be relatively uh, flat because we have such a large spread right now between the 30-year and the 10-year, right? Uh, as the Fed has uh, gone- 30-year fixed and the 10-year treasury. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but, right. Uh, as the Fed has uh, gone from easing, quantitative easing to tightening, but I do expect to see investors coming back in and narrowing that spread. So even though the 10-year treasury might be rising here, the mortgage rate may not uh, may not go up by a, a similar degree but but it's definitely a risk right so if, if mortgage rates do rise appreciably then that would put cold water on the market you know one thing i learned at, at the joint center for housing studies conference uh, we had chris herbert who was the executive i think the managing director of uh, the harvard center for housing and he asked me to speak at the conference we had, i think we had him on a couple of weeks ago uh, one thing i learned at the conference is that new home builders have effectively cut price dramatically. Yeah. Uh, they're they're uh, saying, and these are C CEOs of you know major home builders, down ten percent from the peak, and that goes to you know uh, various concessions, including interest rate buy downs, uh, right. so called interest rate buy downs, where the builder will effectively lower the rate for the buyer to get them into that home and. Uh, and so we've already seen a pretty significant adjustment in new home prices. If you if you believe that, not so not yet an existing price, right? Chris, you want to just mention quickly our 
our own house price index that we construct. We just published the January uh, number for HPI house price index uh, yesterday. That's right. So uh, Moody's Analytics house price index was down 1% in the month of January from December. That's significant, right? Um, it had been pretty flat for the last uh, few months, right? We had basically we had a, a decline in the second quarter of last year. Um, we plateaued for a bit in in the fall, and now we're seeing another leg down. So we're down about about two percent, I would say. Mm. Um, so we are seeing those uh, price adjustments uh, occurring in the existing family side, but it's going to be you know a, a bit Slow. of a tug and war, right? Zigzag uh, across here. So. It's Did you notice that the Bay Area, California prices are down over 10? Did you see that though? From yeah. the peak. Yeah. 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 So you're definitely seeing some markets that are. Yeah. My home in Philly is fine. Just saying. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay in Philly. Uh, of course, the prices never rose. So that, you know. That helps. <laughs> that helps. That helps. <laughs> they don't go up. They don't go down. Hey, Bill, well, do you want to play and, this and game? That was the fascinating thing. You know, this was so uneven with the house oh, yeah. prices. And, and because, you know, the national level would it it, it it averaged out to this higher number um, that I always felt that was a misleading, you know, sort of part of the story. Um, and ironically, uh, for those of us who worry about gentrification, it, it tended to slow gentrification, what was going on. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, do you want to play the game, Bill? I, I it, well, you, I you, I will play the game, but okay. Um, I'm I I have two numbers, uh, but in fairness, so that it doesn't, you know, you warn me, it can't be too obscure. So well, so I will. That's okay. It comes it's from okay. The, you can do whatever I, you're comfortable with. Go okay. Ahead. Well, it comes from the CPI. So so my CPI. two numbers are one point three and nine. Pa all positive. One point three and nine. Uh huh. Comes from the consumer price index. Yes. Are they categories? Or yes, categories. Category. And is it uh, month to month or year over year? Year over year. So it's two different categories of of uh, 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 CPI. One's up one. You said one point three. The other, three is, the nine. other is nine. Boy, that's interesting because uh, he's, he's doing. He's he's picked two categories that. There's some meaning to them, some yeah. deep meaning, some deep, deep meaning. Nine uh, percent feels like food prices. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, is that right, Bill? It's uh, it is it is uh, something people consume. Yes. Oh, it, it, are both things people consume? One point yes. three in. Oh, yes. is not nine can't be egg egg prices? Can they? Can no? Because no, it would like, be higher than that. I think yeah. year. One point three. One point three is like chicken wings. No, <laughs> like the food. only reason I know that is because you know the Super Bowl. You know Philly right. was all into the Super Bowl, so all, all we were doing is eating wings. And they actually we've got a lot of wings. Uh, the avian flu has really hurt chickens that lay eggs, but apparently it, I'm learning it, all this it, stuff it about chickens. Left them with wings, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that sounds really morbid somehow, but yeah, okay. Uh, well, yeah, I I, I did give you a little bit of a warning because I hesitated on the you consume it, but food uh oh you oh no uh, that is really perplexing what he just said you can it's food but you don't you consume it but not i really mean some food. people wouldn't say it's food it, it it is something you consume but i, I don't i mean you know food, uh, it's a, oh, broad, I see. a broad sense food is it a beverage or? a beverage exactly oh i see Alcoholic beverage. It's in the alcoholic beverage category. Yes. Oh, oh, uh, beer. Beer. Beer is nine. Okay. Beer is nine. Up beer, nine. beer at home. Beer bought. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Is beer nine. at home uh, is nine. And hard liquor is one point three. And whiskey hard liquor is one point three. Oh, the, I this I posit as the true. What's the counterfactual to understand price movement? Okay. Right. Because the supply of whiskey is, you know, practically vertical, you, unless you're cheating and you're labeling, <laughs> and you hope that no one, you know, pays attention. But it's perfectly vertical. So why would whiskey be up one point three but beer up nine? Nine because you have to have brains all the time, and. Um, 
and the price of grains have been up. And oh, so, but whiskey is a whiskey depends on the whiskey, but doesn't it depend on like? Well, a, I mean, yeah, but you 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 could get one year aged whiskey. Oh, I see. But, I see. But one I year, see. I mean, you. Keep, oh, I see. You, I see. You, you, it's not. Yeah. Gold whiskey. Yeah, you're saying. In the here and now, the beer relies on the here and now grain supply, and that's problematic, you know, grains prices because of the Russian invasion and everything else. But for the for the uh, whiskey and other hard liquors that you know uh, mature over time, the the supply here and now isn't as big a deal. Therefore, the price isn't up as much. Because I well, thought it would no, but... but if demand, if you're telling a demand story, right? Oh, so, uh, yeah, and, and and alcohol is very much a normal good, contrary yeah. to what people think. Yeah, higher income, you spend more money. Yeah. Oh, I see. Alcohol. I see. And so, so why, why isn't, why isn't whiskey being bid up? It, 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 it has this vertical supply curve. The price of whiskey should be moving, but it, it's, it's not, not doing very much. And beer is doing about what I would expect, given that they have to get barley and hops, and hops is hurt greatly by the heat wave in Europe. So. I bet you're a great professor. I bet like, teach, I bet kids love you. This whole this whole beer whiskey thing, they're all over that. I yeah. Mean, yeah. <laughs> Mark, right, you Dante, wouldn't you uh, – Penn you State, wouldn't you want Bill to be there and... teaching you that, you know, about the, the beer and the whiskey? I would. Yeah, it's, it's a better yeah. way to frame it, yeah. Anyway. All you're right. I, over to beer, Mark, are you? Maybe that's the – I. You know, I, that could be a fact. Per, that's too personal a question, okay. Chris. <laughs> Oh, De Dante's hey, travel plans are fine. That is over the line. That is over the line. <laughs> it only dishes out the tough questions, Chris. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> right, exactly. No, wait, that's not fair. People who listen to this podcast know way more about me than they know about you guys. Because, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. But that's over the line. But anyway, we got to move on because we're running out of time. And I, I promise, Bill, we uh, only take an hour. But I want to come back to another uh, quick topic around policy mm -hmm. uh, and it goes uh, almost all the way back to the discussion we had around chips mm -hmm. and the Biden administration's uh, really interesting kind of focus on let's call it industrial policy, you know, mm -hmm. policies that are implemented to help support some aspect of the U S economy. It's not, you know, broadly uh, it's not focused on broadly helping the economy, but certain uh, sectors of the economy, like the Chips Act that was passed last year. That's obviously for the chip industry, which is now just being rolled out. The Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed at the end of last year, was really focused on you know incenting green uh, energy uh, production and, and investment. Mm -hmm. uh, even the in infrastructure uh, bill, to some degree, you know, is kind of you know designed to help you know U.S. industry, transportation, distribution, manufacturing, and. The interesting thing to me is when I first was coming up as a professional economist and going uh, in graduate school, industrial policy was kind of sort of a an, was a uh, verboten, right? You, you, mm -hmm. No one liked the idea of industrial policy. You can't pick winners and losers. But here we are. It feels like the administration is kind of sort of going down that path and everyone seems to be on board. You know, there's seems some bipartisan support because the president got bipartisan, got Republican votes for certainly for the infrastructure legislation and the chips act, not the IRA, the inflation reduction act, but nonetheless, um, is, is that, what, what do you think of that? Do I characterize that bill in, in, uh, correctly? And, uh, what do you think of that policy, uh, uh, kind of initiative and change that the administration is engaged in? No, I think that's a very accurate, characterization, I think, as typical economists, you know, put their blinders on. Uh, it, it is impossible to have a, a neutral set of policies. That it's just not possible. There is a reality. We had an industrial policy. Right. We favored certain activities over others. Um, nobody ever complained about um the huge amount of money the United States spends on military. That created a kind of sick economy. Going all the way back to Bill Clinton, um, one of his top advisors, remember, noted that like almost 90% of the, it's some huge number, I don't remember what it was 90, but it was some improbable huge number of, of American manufacturing and electronics 
was defense, that American manufacturers had given up consumer electronics because the margins were so high on defense. They had all sorts of protections from competition in so many ways. So they gave up consumer electronics, even though we're the ones who practically invented so much of it. Uh, you know, whether we invented the the the, the stereo system, right? Because we invented the gramophone, uh, the, the record player. Uh, we invented the television, um, and we played a hard, uh, a, a very hard and huge role in, in radio. So consumer electronics, and we invented the telephone. So you know, in terms of consumer electronics, we had this natural advantage, but we had given it up because because hidden in all the policies was do it for defense, but worrying about a 1% or 2% margin, we're not gonna worry about a one or 2% margin, we won't do it. We, we let other countries get away with all sorts of subsidies because other countries have industrial policy. They understood, for instance, you wanna control flat screens. We gave up televisions. And yet flat screen technology is really important. Um, so the reality is that there never was this level playing field and it mm -hmm. was just, you know, people just compete and, you know, we're not favoring anything either by not responding to what other countries were doing on labor standards, on wages, on forced labor, you name it. If you're gonna let the wild, wild west go on outside the US uh, in terms of all of that. The WTO, it turns out, is not really an enforcer or solution to making all of that neutral. Then you have a default industrial policy, which did not favor American manufacturing. And so this, I think, is a final sort of response that we uh, grown up. We, We've taken the blinders off and, and we realize that our policies got us what we got because implicitly, I would say explicitly, right? We've favored certain activities on a relative sense. And, and this is a simple recalibration. And we saw that it hurt us because we had built supply chains that were way too thin that did not incorporate the real risks involved and that um, going forward, that wouldn't be a good position. So absent what the president was doing, there are a number of companies that were reshoring some activities with that realization. But what the president is doing is simply making those decisions even easier in a way, if, if, if you will. Uh, and and it, is, it is in our interest. We, we should not have totally given up a lot. The new technology that's going on in manufacturing, which is gonna increase productivity even more, is all process technology. And one thing that I think is a realization in American manufacturing is when you do give up production, when you think all I do is just design the product, you give up on the process technology. Because you don't, your your engineers aren't on the floor every day trying mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, how can I make a uh, television? Because you don't make them, so so all of that process technology, that's the smart technology that that's being put in place, has also signaled to many companies you got to onshore because if you're not actively making the product, there are huge elements of new technological uh, advances that are taking place, you don't get to participate in because you've taken yourself out of their game. So, so I think part of this is a realization from companies, partly because of smart technology and manufacturing, partly because they saw how exposed they were that the supply chains were way too thin and didn't have nearly enough redundancies uh, built in. And, and then this incentive by the president. And, and all of this gets back to why I'm you know, so upset with the Fed because while these companies are trying their best to make adoption to the risks 
the world will face going forward, just flood things are going to increase. Global warming is going to continue to wreak havoc on food production and because of floods and severe storms on, on the production of goods. And, and as we saw from the pandemic, even if it's not a global pandemic, the risk of a country having uh, a, a severe health uh, disruption can make us vulnerable. Um, and, and as we found out from the chips, it turns out, you know, there's like three companies that are doing everything. Yeah. So, so I think all of this requires us to think anew about ensuring that companies can respond. If I'm trying to respond to a chip shortage as the auto industry was, and you have all your buyers out beating every door they can to get chips, the last thing I want is for the Fed to say, oh no, we don't want to sell cars. Like, yeah. how can I solve this problem? And you're trying to destroy my market. <laughs> this is not, this is not complementary of what needs to take place. Uh, and going forward, we we need that flexibility. Um, we need companies to know there's still going to be demand on the other side of me solving the supply shock. And there are going to be more supply shocks. We just have to get used to that. Yeah. Well. So yeah, it's an interesting point. You're saying, look, uh, we've always had an industrial policy, but, but before now, it was really, you know, not by design. It was it was but de facto. It, it just happened, uh, not with no deliberation, no thought. It just you know we did it because there's winners and losers with any tax policy or spending policy. So uh, if 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 that's the case, then uh, and we've always had industrial policy. Let's just be more deliberate about it. And think about it, and and design it so that uh, we, you know, at least we have a fighting chance of making it more effective. You, there, there will always be cases where we pick the wrong winners and fail to help the, you know, fail to help the winners, and and and, um, you know what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we didn't get the, we didn't get the winners and the the losers right, but you know uh, that's better than just kind of throwing up your hands and and just letting industrial policy run amok. Um, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and I, you keep coming back to the Fed. Um, you know, you're saying there that, uh, you know, look, uh, the the reason why inflation is high is is just give it time. You know, it'll settle in. No reason to slam this economy into the ground. And by the way, by slamming the economy into the ground, you're making it more difficult for these companies to execute on taking advantage of the you know what the administration is doing here with regard to industrial mm -hmm. policy. So very interesting. Um, okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground and uh, taken a lot of your time, and really appreciate it. Uh, and um, and I want to thank you for uh, spending over an hour with us. Uh, any last words, guys? Anything else you want to say, or should we call this a podcast? I, you know, it's Bill. We were we were joking last uh, podcast that our they always end up being an hour and ten minutes, and. And uh, I think this is going to be an hour and 10 minutes. And, and, and the lot, uh, thinking was that that's when we run out of juice. So I think that's why I've run out of juice. I think we've all run out of juice. We know to, we need to go get some lunch. So uh, with that, any la any last words? Sit, hearing none? Okay, we're going to call Thanks this a for podcast. Me. Pardon me? Thanks for including me. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. You come back anytime. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, you got to come back with a better, another example, beer, whiskey example that, you know, when, when you, when you got that, we'll, we'll have you back on, but, but with, okay. with that, we're going to call it a podcast. Thank you, everyone. Take care now.